The Box Seat, brought to you by our stable of sponsors. Woodland Stud, Brecon Farms, New Zealand Bloodstock Standard Bread, Stonewall Stud, The Clubs, Alexandra Park, Cambridge, Addington and Ashburton, Garrard's Horse and Hound, and IRT. It's your horse and our passion. Hi everyone, welcome into another edition of Your Box Seat, brought to you by our stable of sponsors. A big thank you to them getting in behind the show once again. Michael Guerin, a few races to review and plenty to preview as the roadshow moves to Alexandra Park. Sure does, Gregory. Big hi to you. Hi to all our viewers around New Zealand and Australia, of course. Looking forward to your piece a bit later on in this show on Angus Garrard, one of the young guns of Australian harness racing. Good chance to get to know someone a bit better who we might be gambling on for a few decades ahead, Gregory. But you're right, the roadshow not only moves north, but you've got some interesting news about where some of the biggest names in New Zealand harness racing are heading. So lots of pieces on the chessboard, Gregory, moving in different directions. And one of those pieces moving, the horse at the head of the market for the Taylor Mile. Yeah, exactly. So let's get straight into it by heading to Rangiora, their big race day, uh, the Rangiora Classic. First run in 2004, a couple of the best paces in the land went head to head here, Michael Guerin, and the Waimakariri businesses at Rangiora Classic. Self-assured, worked his way to the lead. Spankham was outside him, there wasn't a lot between them in the end, and they broke 3-8 for the 2600 metres, so it was a cracking battle, but uh, he's very brave, self-assured, he's had an outstanding season and he caps that off by winning the Classic. Might be enough also, Greg, to win him our Harness Horse of the Year, or at least Pacer of the Year, definitely aged Pacer of the Year. Maybe Amazing Dream comes back into the conversation if she can win two or three of the Group 1s coming up. I feel sorry for Spanken. He's had a remarkably brave season and has run second and almost every race that matters after not having the best of runs, but self-assured, I think at the moment, Greg, that result probably sums him up. He's probably about a neck, sometimes on his best day of length, better than Spankham. I know he's off to the paddock. Really interesting, uh, the news you have coming up on where Spankham's heading. Yeah, I spoke to Hayden Cullen, so you're right, self-assured, nice break for him. He'll be back in the uh, spring and looking to defend his IRT New Zealand Cup in November. But Spankham is going on an Australian holiday. He'll be making his way to Queensland, having a crack at that carnival there. I said to Hayden, what, sort of eight to ten weeks? He said, yeah, something like that. And I said, is there a chance that we might not see him? He said, no, he's definitely coming back. He'll have another crack at the New Zealand Cup. He's already been placed in it twice, of course, but... Uh, There'll be some nice low-hanging fruit there for him in Australia, particularly over the shorter course, Michael, because as we know, he's pretty potent. Uh, anything around 2,000 metres or less. Yeah, Al Albion Park, a normal Saturday night, he would just clean those horses up eight or nine times out of ten. The carnival there uh, this season is going to be really strong. There's a chance Lock and Varart turns up, but more likely King of Swing heads there, and King of Swing's a very similar horse to spank him. Um, there's enough horses like Expensive Ego coming through in the grades over there. Amazing Dream could well end up in Queensland as well. So I think he'll dominate on a normal Saturday um, during the carnival when the big money comes up for grabs. I think he'll be one of the horses in the mix. If he was mine, Greg, gee, would be tempting to leave him over there. I, I know the logical place to send him to would be Luke McCarthy's and Belinda McCarthy's at Menangle, which they already have King of Swing and a bunch of horses like that. But Spanker would be, if not the best, the second best of those horses, and they could put him on a cycle where he races the week that King of Swing doesn't. So over the course of a year, he would probably win more money in Australia, particularly in somewhere like Perth, if he was to go there. But I also know that he's a syndicate-owned horse, and there's five or six or seven or eight people in him. And they'll probably get more joy, Greg, out of racing than here. But I still think a lot of people forget, Greg, Amazing Dream raced as a three-year-old filly in Queensland last winter. I still think there's a really good case to be made for the sounder and the, uh, the horses who like the racing all the time to do this sort of thing, to head offshore, become an Australian for three or four months and come home. It, it didn't affect... Amazing dream last season. I think some horses that suit, I don't think it would suit self assured. So I think they're making the right decision both ways. Um, out of that race, Greg, I thought Cranbourne pretty good. 
stepping up against the big boys for the first time. Yeah, they're very keen, obviously, on a, a cup tilt in November, and he certainly has stood up uh, against them on that Sunday. You would have noted there Johnny Cox, he had the drive behind self assured and got the business done. There was in a black armband uh, the passing of Clary Woodward that was to acknowledge. Clary trained about 50 odd winners and drove about 160, uh, so a nice touch there from uh, Johnny Cox as well. But self assured was uh, too good there. Uh, let's move on to the three year old stakes where pace and pride dropped out of the derby along with a number of others worked to the lead Michael once he got there 223.8 excellent time for the mile and a quarter in the Qatari Downs three year old classic and a good effort from got you covered as it was in the derby and the only filly in the race better talk art getting through on the inside but he's smart pace and pride he was a little bit too strong and in the end uh, he got the business done there in the three year old classic what will be interesting now as we head towards the harness jewels as a Effectively, the three-year-olds don't have a huge amount of opportunity to race between now and the duels, although the market unlikely to change a lot. $1.70 uh, about crew to take out the three-year-old uh, Emerald. Pace and Pride currently sits about the $8 mark. Uh, and then you've got the likes of Shan Noble at uh, nine, uh, sorry, about six dollars. So um, yeah, BD Joe's about that six dollar mark too, and so crucial for him around Cambridge will be the barrier draw. But yeah, Krug I, I, at the moment a dollar seventy. I think for the Morgan, you can't bet into that market. If Krug no. draws the second line, it'll be three dollars. Yeah. If he draws outside BD Joe, he might even be three two dollars fifty again because there'll be no handing up around Cambridge. Different situation yeah. in the Derby at, at Addington. Pace and Pride's a really good horse, but he's indicative. Um, there was a bit of news last week from uh, from Johnny Turner on Twitter that Regazzo Max actually staying in the country for the jewels too. He's indicative of those horses, and that's Regazzo Mac and maybe to a lesser degree American Dealer, a whole bunch of them. They're good enough to beat these type of horses most weeks. Uh, Pid them in the open grade against Krug. They're probably not good enough to beat him. They're going to make their way towards open class, and the question is now: What do you do with them? Do you sell? and maybe get your 100, 150, 200, Greg? Or do you keep them? And different people have different reasons for these sorts of things. You know, obviously, the more people in a horse, Greg, the less reason to sell. You're getting less money back for it. But it's a daunting time when you own a good three-year-old because now, pace and pride, you can think to yourself, I'm still going to be three in Australia to December 31st. Yep. So he's worth more to somebody else or he's worth more over in Australia. He's actually worth more money than he is here. So it's a really tricky one. Do you want to keep your horse and we want you to keep your horse here? Yeah. Or does economically it make more sense to send them offshore, whether you retain the ownership of the horse offshore or you sell them? And I think that's going to be a really big question, Greg, for a whole bunch of people. And I'm talking from Krug, he's not going to yep. sell. Everything else in that group there, that Regazzo, McPace and Pride, Yara Kobe's, the whole bunch of them. Yep. Do we cash him up now? And that's that's a conundrum which used to be quite big for the owners of three-year-olds. It's significantly bigger now. Yeah, it certainly is. Uh, Rangiora Sunday had a bad smash in race number one. Uh, Kevin Townley, where they ended up putting the race uh, races back one full race. Uh, Kevin was taken to hospital. He actually got a new hip out of it. Um, so he's got a new hip, Michael, and, and we wish him uh, a speedy recovery uh, there. You never like to see those sorts of accidents. Uh, and also from Addington last Friday night, Steve Clark uh, driving the Dera Franco had quite a bad uh, smash there. And I spoke to Steve. Um, he He's pretty sore uh, and he'll be out of action for a good couple of weeks, a uh, bit of an AC joint problem there. Uh, but he did want me to pass on how uh, well he was treated by St John's and he said you, you just don't realise uh, until something like that happens uh, how quickly they move into action and they wanted to make sure everything was A-OK -okay with him and he, and he wanted to also thank all of the people that uh, had sent him messages etc. So a couple of accidents over the weekend but uh, uh, both of the horses, the horses are, are all fine, Adira Franco he said had a few abrasions and stuff, but uh, overall they uh, came out of it pretty well. And um, yeah, like I say, we never like to see those sorts of accidents. And Kevin Townley's been a big part of the industry for a very, very long time. Yeah, Kevin's had back issues in the past as well, so I'm glad to hear it. both men are OK, and obviously the horses are OK, okay Gregory. And yeah, Kevin now will be back out of the sulky for a bit longer as well. So uh, let's hope he's got some good staff around him because he's got some pretty good horses and some maybe potentially some jewels-bound horses um, who are going to need some work.
All right, let's go to Cambridge from last Thursday night. It was a heat of the sire stakes there, and Major Perry uh, got the business done here. This is with Garrards, of course. It was heat number two. Uh, Montana DJ in front. Bit of pressure from uh, a classy operator for the majority of the race, but this horse dashed through up the passing lane, uh, along with strength and honour. Brent Mangos uh, getting through on the inside too, hitting the line strongly. Uh, but ultimately, the art major, Katie Perry, Major Perry, too strong here, Michael. Yeah, bred to be good, and he's been luckless so far in his campaign. A long way from home, he was going to win this race because there was a lot of pressure up front. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a sprint race around Cambridge. If you want to attack, you get the chance to attack, but it softened up the leader. Um, Major Perry spoke to Scott Phelan, who co-trains, and of course there he is driving the horse. He said, once he got to the lead, he should have shut up shop a little bit, and that gave Strength and Honor the chance to run at him, but still a very good debut from Strength and Honor. So Mango has a nice horse there who's qualified for the final. Montana DJ's also qualified. People always have this belief that in the uh, size stakes, the first two get you into the final. First three always, always, as long as I've been doing this, Greg, get you into the final. So yeah. they'll all be in the final, they'll head down south. Uh, Scott and, and Barry um, have a great bunch of two-year-olds, two good male two-year-olds, three good female two-year-olds. So they don't buy that many horses at the sales, Greg, and they're buying at the top end now and, and they're getting really good returns. Um, for their owners. Who's the best of this two-year-old crop? I have absolutely no idea, Greg, but they did say that um, Major Perry's the faster of those two just yet, but Montana G DJ the tougher of those two. So how that all shakes out, um, I guess we'll find out over the next six weeks. Yeah, market for that size stakes uh, final with Garrard's. $3 about Cosmic Major, a Cooter 340. There was nothing between them and the welcome stakes, of course. Bollinger gets its chance this week, 550. Franco Max, 750. And then out to uh, Montana DJ around the $11 mark. Two year old trot at Addington Raceway. Uh, this one with Hydroflow from last Friday night as well. And uh, Michael Purden getting the job done here. Blair Orange doing the steering with Mystic Max. Uh, here was the winning performance. Actually galloped on debut in the trotting stakes inside the last hundred, was going to run in the top four. Um, by Village Mystic, who we don't know too much about, Michael, first win in New Zealand. Michael Purden spotted this, he, he follows the European trotters, and nice wee story there about that. Uh, ended up not getting any owners for it, so he owns it outright himself, and uh, it was really nice, really good, strong performance, and a horse that's clearly stepped up. The big talking point out of the race, Highgrove, uh, he's the $1.65 favourite for the jewels, of course. Had a gallop at about the same spot he galloped in that trotting stakes. The difference this time, they went about three seconds faster. There's Michael Purden there. Uh, very happy with his charge there. Um, was they just went that much faster that John wasn't able to move, and they ran home in about 28 and a piece. Now, two-year-old trotters doing that means you're not going to make up a lot of ground, particularly if the leader's as strong as what Mystic Max was. Now, he was really good. Obviously, I'd never heard of the horse until he produced this performance. Everybody was looking at high growth. I thought made really good ground out wide on the track, so no pot on him. But, yeah, it's a bit of a minefield back in the two-year-old trotters when they get that short. Um, big week for the Purden Sons, of course, because uh, Michael um, having that one in, and Nathan over in Australia. Things are really gaining momentum for him. Father Mark went across for the sales, purchased a couple of horses with Nathan, so he's getting good support over there. And he is starting to roll out really nice two-year-olds at the trials, Greg. So um, the two sons, um, who obviously are trainers in their own right, uh, things starting to look promising for both of them. By the way, Mark was in Victoria. He has returned to Auckland, Greg, so he'll be very hands-on with the Hayden Cullen stable horses this week in the countdown to Friday night. Yeah, and I know Natalie's been up there uh, working with the horses as well during the week. Uh, let's get into that preview of Alexandra Park. Uh, it's Group 1 racing there of uh, course over $360,000 in stakes there on Friday night. First one we want to have a look at, Michael, is the Taylor Mile. Uh, this is the 35th running with Dawson, Harfoot and Partners. Here's copy that at the trials. The week before, a little bit lacklustre. What happened here was Morris launched him from the half. 55 to 26 8. You see him chasing him all the way to the line. You mentioned uh, that Ray Green felt that he might be a run short. Well, after after this, this should sharpen him up nicely. Thanks very much. Yeah, the week before, he just mucked around. He got beaten by Darling Me on a wet day. He just looked like he wasn't 
interested, to be perfectly honest, Greg, and, and Ray and Morris had a talk and said, look, we can't have that, so we need to get into him. So he was last in that trial, starting the last 600, took off, um, very quick times for, for Pukakaui, and, and Morris, well, not sitting up on him, he you know, had the reins up in the air, actually gave him a couple of taps to get his mind on the job. Spoke to Morris about that, he said he'll be fine for Friday night, and he's been heavily backed uh, in a race where he hasn't drawn perfectly, but he's drawn better than Amazing Dream, which is the crucial factor. So opened around 2.10 into $1.85 as we record this. I would expect him to continue to shorten to maybe $1.70 because there's good horses drawn inside and green, but there's a belief that he may well run to the front. I'm not entirely sure that's true, but he still has more options than Amazing Dream. Inside him's a really interesting horse and bad to the bone. We haven't seen here since cup time, but has been to Menangle, won four of seven over there, including a 150.5. So by far the quickest mile on the race, won a group three. He's got barrier two, and he's been honed on that Menangle racing, Greg. He might have a bit of gate speed. So I spoke to Zach Butcher. He said, look, we're going to go forward, do our best. Also in between the barrier four is Kango, who is quite a big rolling horse, and again, not a definite hand up horse, Greg. So I, for people watching this who think, copy that, he'll just run to the front and be winning, that may well be true. But it's not an absolute gimme. There's a couple of horses inside him who are big, strong horses, Greg. Over the mile at Alexandra Park, once they get round that first bend, they might half think about parking him out there. So I do think he's top pick in the race. I think Amazing Dream, who's going to be racing in the same colours, actually. They're both now the Harness Jewels leaders of their division. I think she'll come around at some stage and look to get involved. But I, I almost went from for, as better the week because I think it'll be very honed down and fit. But I just think, Craig, there could be a few moving parts to this race and a few drivers who think, well, it's only a mile. I'm happy enough to stay in front. Yeah, $1.85, uh, the price if you want to take it for him, about $13 for Bad to the Bone, who's been in great form. And it's probably a surprise when you consider that Kango is rated where he is, that he's a $6.50 chance. And he clearly wasn't as sharp as what he perhaps was around Christmas time. So, um, yeah, be really interesting. The Dawson Harfit Limited 2021 Taylor Mile, of course, the key lead up to the Messenger next week. Continuing on with our preview, let's get to the Anzac Cup. And, of course, uh, Sunday Sun, well, two years ago. We didn't have one last year, of course. This is what he did at Alexandra Park. He was a four-year-old. That's him sitting back last, Michael, and you're thinking, why am I showing this from the 800? I wanted to show you because he did this. Loop the whole field. Here's Mark Cooler out in front. We know he's a Dominion winner, trotting mile record holder at Ashburton. Um, he just looped them here. Yes, he was in sublime form. I think he's not that far off that now, having had those two very uh, strong performances at Addington Raceway, particularly the second one. If he brings this form to this race, the same as he did two years ago, that speeding spur coming out wide as well, um, gee, he'll be hard to beat. He will be. I think the thought process around this race for most people is that Majestic Man will lead. So what we're showing you here is what Sunday Sun can do and often does do two very good leaders. Whether that's Majestic Man Cooler. wide out, by the way. Yeah, exactly. That's him, that's him driven differently in the old days when they were just teaching him to be an open-class horse. I think the best version of Sunday Sun is going to win this race. But if we go back to Addington over those two runs, we didn't see the best version. OK, willing to forgive the first one. He was off 20 metres. That's OK. Second one, he was clearly outported by Muscle Mountain. But Muscle Mountain's not here. Mm. So if you take Muscle Mountain out of that previous race, he's beaten half the field he's going to meet this week by quite a margin. Can he sit parked outside Majestic Man and beat him over 2,200 metres? Well, I put to Phil Williamson, uh, the trainer of Majestic Man, exactly where is your horse? He said, look, he came back from Sydney. We were really happy with him. We haven't trialled him, but he has got a bit woolly. His, his winter coat started to come through because obviously it's a lot hotter in Sydney than it is in Oamaru this time of year. He said, look, we're confident we can lead and, and run them, but are we confident we can hold off Sunday Sun and Bolt for Brilliance? Not so much. So I think there's a little bit of a wait and see on Majestic Man, who's quite short in the market. Sunday Sun, you would presume, is going to be up outside him. Now, a slight change of training for Sunday Sun. Usually when he comes north, Craig Edmonds looks after the horse and they take him out to the beach. But he's been working on the track at Pukekohe because 
He's with five wise men who doesn't have any right-handed experience, Greg. So I spoke to Craig last night. He said, we're working them together, but we do pop Sunday sun out to the beach. So he's had a slight change from his usual beach training regime. Don't think it'll matter too much. I think he's fitter for what happened at Addington, and I think he probably will win. But there's, again, just those little two percenters here and there, Greg. What's going to go on here? I'm not going to lead. I'm not usually doing my usual training regime. Was I good enough at Addington? And I think those two percenters, in December, in this type of race, I rate him a dollar sixty. He just wins. Yep. Two twenty two forty now is about fear, but I doubt he's going to have an easy winning experience. If he's going to win, Greg, he may need to sit park to do it. A couple of interesting runners: Oscar Bonavina pulled a flat tyre at Addington. Drawn barrier two, chance he just slots straight in behind Majestic Man. That gives him his best chance of this campaign. And Bolt for Brilliance is wide on the track, can't see him going forward, uh, therefore he ends up in no man's land. Maybe good enough to win if he gets on the back of Sunday's Sun, but very tricky draw for him, and I think he's incredibly short in the market, and he's the horse who will drift. Yeah, and broke 240, of course, did Sunday Sun when he won the Lyle Creek. Uh, if he brings that form from December, then, yep, he'll take all sorts of beating, and someone thinks that too, because he's dropped from 240 into 220, you're getting 310 uh, about Majestic Man, and then you're out to $3.40 for Bolt for Brilliance. Of course, that will be brought to you by Breckens, who uh, are a big supporter of the show, and we always have a spotlight on trotting with them. Speaking of that, Michael, the retirement of Winterfell. Of course, he took out the National trot and more importantly took out this race which was the Inter-Dominion final. Uh, a, a very good horse, a tough one for the punters though Michael because at times he let us down uh, but when he was at his best like this Inter-Dominion final he was uh, absolutely outstanding. Gregory, if every race in this country was run right-handed Winterfell might have been one of the all-time greats but he just, for a reason I cannot work out and I'm not sure anybody could work it out because he was trained by the best and he could never find the reason. He was excellent left and right handed at three, and as he got older, like a lot of us, he got grumpy. And he said, I have no interest in racing at Addington ever again in my life. Yep. And he was just bizarre, almost unbeatable right handed, apart from a couple of massive handicap jobs he was in. But won that national, won the Inter Dominion. <laughs> Remarkable. To th I, I can't think of a horse in the time I've covered harness racing who was so different one way or the other. Like, Blossom Lady didn't like Alexandra Park, but she at least went into Dominion Consolation there. Yep. Got to the back end of Winterfell's career where he just simply couldn't run at all left-handed. Yep. And it was mental, obviously. So, did a great job, though, for Trevor Casey and, and for all the people involved. He had a magnificent but odd career, and I hope he has a long an enjoyable grass-eating retirement. Yeah, well, he won 13 races and uh, four of those at Group 1 level, so uh, he certainly had a great uh, career and won over 400,000. Speaking of trotters, uh, the Sire Stakes is where we focus next. Here's a trial from Pukekohe. Uh, we spoke to Michael Ward after her second in the derby. He said, I want, well, I want to give her a spin around and see how she handles it right-handed. I actually thought she was excellent here. Yes, she lost the back of... Uh, Mexicana and King's Landing, but what I loved here, Michael, was the last 50 metres. So the winning post comes up on the outside fence there. Have a look at her here. She's finding the line nicely. I know she's got a difficult draw. She's drawn inside five wise men in the Lone Star Sire Stakes Championship, the 23rd running of this event. Um, but I think she'll be even more potent in the derby next week. But I wanted to show you that trial. You've spoken about five wise men. Um, $1.95. You can leave me out of that. One first up, Alexandra Parr. Two from the outside draw. Is he the best three-year-old? I don't think there's any doubt at the moment he has been. But there's a few risks there. And the likes of Mexicana, who loves it right-handed, will give him plenty to think about. Yeah, it's tricky for those those horses. Any horse coming to Alexandra Park for the first time, particularly young trotters, very tricky. That top bend can catch them out. They start to hang in when they get under pressure, which is when they usually are under pressure, the top bend the last time. And that can make them falter, touch a knee. There's lots of things that can happen. I put that to Craig Edmonds. He said, look, we're really pretty confident he'll handle the track because he's very clean gated. But you never sort of know. He only had the one right-handed workout uh, down home before he came north. That's why they're staying at Pookie, so they can work him on the track rather than the beach, which of course is in a straight line. Uh, he, he might just sit parked at Wingrick, 
but I'm not taking a dollar ninety five to find out over a very very long period of time. And I'm talking like back to La Cucaracha. Better horses than five wise men have come to Alexandra Park and been beaten fresh up. Second up next week in the Derby, he'll be a significantly improved horse. He might be too good for these, Greg. And to be honest, I can't find a horse to back to beat him. So make of that what you want. Maybe a Mexicana can lead off the gate and be hard to catch. But I just can't take that price about any horse coming north for this experience at Alexandra Park, Greg. And that's with a database of about 30 years of looking at them. Yep, have to uh, concur. The closing section was 57-7-27-9 in that trial, so that makes Mexicanas run very good. And uh, yeah, you heard what I thought about time up the hill. I thought she was also excellent too. Uh, let's move now to uh, the next, where we want to have a look at Suntan actually taking out its heat at Alexandra Park last week, the night where, of course, the races got... Uh, shut down with the last couple of uh, races. Cover Girl was in that Magnus Benro heat too, Michael. Uh, was well specced in a couple of markets uh, prior so to her debut. Me. That's her in the uh, butt colours coming wide, the old RD colours that Bob has. Uh, really good late in the piece, but um, Suntan was a little bit too strong. A lot to like about this debutante though. Yeah, Suntan was good, but Cover Girl was probably at least as good, and they have different barrier draws this week. So Cover Girl was a prime example of what we just mentioned about five wise men. Alexandra Park, last bend, really hard to, to excel and win on debut, and you almost always tend to be better the second time around. Barrier one this week for Cover Girl. She potentially leads, potentially trails, Greg. That, that's a big help being on the marker pegs, but... I've got no idea who the best of this crop is. True Fantasy makes its northern debut this week again from a wide draw. Pit True Fantasy back in the field, Greg. Hate it, don't want to be on it. Put yep. it up in the front. It's in front with the left to go. Um, OK, they're both $3.30, Michael. Exactly. So which, so which, way, which way would you lean? I don't have an opinion on this race, Greg. I, okay. I simply don't know enough about them. I, yep. I, for example, Montana Mickey. Last week I thought, this is a really good horse. Came out, had an off night. I think that could happen to any one of the horses here. Logic and experience would suggest Cover Girl's the one to beat, but I'm, I'm talking about one video, Greg, and one race video and one trial video. It, it's not a betting race for me. It's a really interesting race. I think it's a really even crop. Um, if, if someone put a gun to my head, maybe Cover Girl, but with Has that happened before? Uh, no, no, thankfully, thankfully not, Greg, because the way I've been, <laughs> some, sometimes over the years, the way I've been tipping or the way you were tipping a few weeks ago, mm. it may not have ended yeah, well. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the market there. Did you have an opinion on it? Uh, what about a gun to your head? No, not really. Uh, uh, <laughs> Montana <laughs> Glory 550. I, I reckon Cover Girl could probably improve, wouldn't need to improve much to actually win it from that barrier draw. So I, I'm happy to think that she can win it. I do think True Fantasy is the best of the crop, but I'm, I'm very dubious about first up Alexandra Park. So, um, yeah, I'd be happy to be on, uh, on Cover Girl for this week. Um, on a sad note, we mentioned a couple of weeks ago that Glenn Scott hadn't been very uh, well. In fact, um, he was gravely ill. He passed away earlier in this week. So to all of his extended family, of course, take my breath away, was successful again at Addington Raceway last Friday night for his father, Fred. A uh, really sad time for the family, and our, our thoughts here from the box seat are certainly with you. Uh, last Sunday at uh, Rangiora, uh, Greg Hope got win number 800 in his career. We celebrated Tony Hurley training his 1,000th recently. Uh, here's his son, uh, Ben, getting through on the inside with Homebush Lad. 692 in partnership with his wife, uh, Nina, of course. I think about 16 or 17 Group 1s, that pair of train, and 108 as an individual. Uh, he's done a remarkable job uh, throughout his career, Michael, more so when he's teamed up with his wife. There's Gregory uh, greeting Ben, as uh, has been the case many times uh, in the last two or three years and of course uh, since joining uh, the Wood End Beach Brigade um, he's become one of our very very best trainers. Well he has and it's a real family affair husband and wife training and the son doing the majority of their driving these days but something I'd never never considered then and I don't mean to be rude by saying it but Nina Hope must be close to being one of our most successful ever trainers as a, as a female. Yep. Because I think Nikki Chilcott would be the most successful, and Michelle Wallace. So they would be, I think, the top two. Natalie Rasmussen obviously has an enormous amount of wins. I don't know exactly how many Natalie's would be, but it'd be a lot. 
But Nina at 692 would also be right up there. So congratulations not only to Greg on the 800, but of course uh, to Nina on, on what's at least in the top five female trainers in New Zealand history, one would think. Let's see, Gregory, if we can potentially find that list for next week. That'll be really oh, I interesting. I think we'll produce that for next week that, for you, well, no, and so I, I think, think you'll find. It, Gregor. <laughs> you'll yes. produce it, Gregory. You'll produce it. Natalie Rasmussen will be right up the top of that list. So, so, uh, so what? So Michelle Wallace, clearly. Yep. Nikki Chilcott. Natalie Rasmussen. Are we missing anybody else who could, would add that? Uh, Colin and Julie trained Colin together. Colin and Julie would have a lot of winners, I've yep. thought of. Um, but yeah. I'd She'll don't. be top five. Yep, she would be. Yep, I don't think there's any doubt about that at all. We're about to take a short break here on your box seat. As we go there, Darla Gurry, speaking of milestones, Kieran Tomlinson, she's made a real impact on the harness code and she racked up win number 50 in her driving Charlie career. John Howe had an outstanding back. weekend, three winners for him over the weekend and he's honing in. It's only a couple short 200 wins in his training career. Uh, so Dala Gary, successful at Addington Raceway. Welcome back into your box seat. Don't forget to contact us either via Twitter or, of course, our email address. Uh, New Zealand Bloodstock Weanling Sale, 3rd of May, 130 going through the ring there. Uh, go online to nzstandardbread.co.nz, check those out. Uh, some really good drafts from Woodlands and Alabar and a whole lot of opportunities for you to get involved in that. We said last week we'd have a profile on a young gun doing the business out of Queensland. Garrard's great supporters of this show. Here's the young Angus and a bit of an insight into what makes him tick. He's certainly making an impression on the harness racing game. Well, it's an absolute pleasure here to be joined on the box seat by one of the young guns of Australasian harness racing, uh, for want of a better term, Angus Garrard. Uh, thanks, Angus, for your time. Gee, it's been a whirlwind couple of years for you. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Greg. Um, it's been unreal. Um, first sort of two years to... Um, certainly surpassed all expectations. Let's start with where it began. We we know the Garrard name is uh, Australasian-wide, well-known in racing. Um, your mum and dad, Darren and uh, Gail, of course, Darren, a trainer. Your grandfather, Chris, he was a trainer, and both of them drove as well. So I, I suppose the fact you've ended up in harness racing is not really a surprise? No, for sure. I think it was always sort of going to happen in some capacity. So, um, yeah. What were your, were your early uh, memories, I suppose? Because, gee, you got into the kids' carts nice and early, didn't you? Yeah, I started um, when I was, I think, six. Um, drove for nine and a half, ten years in them. Um, that was sort of a real good kickstart and sort of kicked along the interest as well. So, yeah, that was really good. You had a bit of success as well. Uh, I'll touch on you coming to New Zealand in a moment. But uh, Menangle was a, a pretty happy hunting ground for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, we sort of, we had, I think, participated in three or four into Dominions in Benangle, um, and a few, I think, five or six Miracle Miles um, managed to win three of them. That was sort of pretty exciting. Um, and yeah. What about school for you, Angus? Were you going to eat your lunch and play sport with your mates, or were you a bit of a scholar? Nah, for sure, more sport and. Um, yeah, school was really good. It was um, they were really cooperative even while I was doing kids' carts. So sort of happy for me to take time off to do that. Even I just sort of got everything done. Um, but yeah, they were really supportive all the way through. All right, so you get into a stable, you start working for your dad. Is that where things kicked off? Yeah, for sure. Yep, and you got straight into to your driving. You never forget your first, and and it was for your mum and dad. So that made it even more special. Tell us about that race. Yeah, it was um, sort of, I think it was probably three weeks after I got my licence. Um, we'd actually sort of got that mare not long before. Um, 
we got her ourselves and she was racing quite well. We sort of just needed a bit of luck and she turned up that day. We managed to get him behind the leader and she uh, got up via the passing lane. So, yeah, that was um, very special. A really special moment for you. I think it was about June of that year and uh, about a year later you got your first Metropolitan win as well. So um, they are important, aren't they, especially early on in your career? Yeah, for sure. I think they sort of, those first two, as you said, the Metro and your first winner, they sort of, I suppose they bring a bit of, bring yourself um, to a bit of attention with other owners and trainers. And yeah, it sort of probably got me a lot of support, those two milestones. Angus, your uh, first full season of driving, so you drove 10 winners in that first year, but your first full season was an elongated season. It was when the dates changed in terms of the racing season in Australia. But if we just look at it from a a 12-month calendar point of view, 125 wins, first junior in Queensland harness racing history to get past the three-figure total, uh, that that must just been uh, blow-your-mind stuff for you. Yeah, for sure. It was unbelievable. Um, I never expected any kind of results like that. Like I was sort of happy to, I was sort of looking to drive probably 40, maybe 50 winners if I was lucky that first season. Um, I just got super support from a lot of big owners and trainers and of course smaller owners and trainers as well, but everyone sort of kicked me along and helped me along the way. What about mentors in terms of of your driving? Who have you looked up to and and, uh, who are your idols if you like? Um, well, sort of always grew up watching Luke McCarthy and, well, all the McCarthy boys, really. Um, them, Kylie Rasmussen, Natalie Rasmussen, um, Daryl Graham, Shane Graham, those sort of guys, they're just, I suppose, the pinnacle and it's sort of hard to look past them. And even sort of Gavin Lang, Chris Alford down in Victoria and that, um, I've always looked up to them in a pretty special way. You mentioned Gavin Lang there, one of the greats of of all time, the late Gavin Lang, of course. Do you model yourself on someone like him or or are you your own man in that regard? Um, I guess when you're sort of grown up watching him, you can't help but model yourself a little bit off all of them. I suppose there's sort of little parts of everyone I've watched in my driving now. But, yeah, like, I mean, if you can be sort of half as good as Gavin Lang, it's pretty uh, unbelievable. So, yeah. What about this season? 43 wins. Um, you're, you're going very well in all premierships. In fact, looking at the uh, the state premiership, I think you're third equal along with uh, Talia McMullen. Um, and, of course, you're leading equal uh, concession junior driver. But on the Metro Drivers Premiership, you're ahead of people like Grant Dixon and a couple of other very, very Hayden Barnes, really good drivers. Um you must look at that sometimes and go, is that, is that actually me? Am I, am I actually on that list? <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's, it's still unreal. Like, even that first season, it's still unreal looking back on that. It's just, it's happened so quick and the support I've received is just out of this world. Okay, 230 wins in the, the bank. Explain to me a normal working week for Angus Garrard. How does it pan out for you? Um... Well, generally, Monday's no racing, so um, generally it's just up and work the horses in the morning. We're working about a team of 12, Dad and I at the moment, so um, that keeps us busy enough. So get that done and sort of, I suppose, try and relax and look at a bit of form that day while we got spare time. Um, Tuesday, um, there's races at Albion Park um, every week, so... Off to there at probably 11 o'clock every Tuesday. Um, that's sort of a pretty long day normally. And then Wednesday night, um, that's a big night as well. There's trials before the race is there, so that's sort of from 4 o'clock to anywhere between 9 and 10.30 sort of thing. Um, and then Thursday's back at Redcliffe, early start. We go probably first race is normally about 12 then. Um, and we run through to about 5 o'clock. Um, and then Friday is generally a day meeting, um, night meeting tonight. But it's a real long one too. We normally 
start early, finish late. Um, and then Saturday nights, obviously, the Metro meeting. That's sort of, I suppose, what you look forward to all week. Um, normally get on the better horses, and that's always a big night. What's your favourite track? Um, oh, it's sort of hard to say. Um, I've only really driven Albion, um, Redcliffe and Marburg yep. on um, big horses, but sort of, as you said before, I drove an angle on the ponies. It's sort of pretty unreal. Um, it's something very different. I'd like to have a go at, obviously. Um, Addington, I really liked it when I was over there. I think it's a really nice track. Now, that was um, like 2016 you came for the kids' carts, didn't you? Yeah. And got yeah, to that's right. New Zealand Cup week? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was um, really good. Mate, do you follow the New Zealand harness racing scene? Do you keep an eye on that? And I suppose, do you watch the box seat? You might watch maybe one time anyway. Yeah, I sort of, um, I try and keep an eye on the New Zealand racing a bit, like predominantly the top liners and that, but um, sort of see where free-for-allers and up-and-comers over there are at. But yeah, I've been sort of getting into the box seat the last sort of four or five episodes I've been watching it. So um, yeah. It's a really enjoyable show to watch. So you nicknamed the kid. Where did that come from? Were you part of that process, I suppose? Yeah, so um, when we raced in Queensland, decided to kick off this bit of a promotion. Um, it's probably 18 months or more ago now. Um, prior to COVID, we sort of sat down with a design team um, and they came to us with a few ideas and um, we sort of got to choose one and lead them sort of in the direction we wanted to go and they sort of built our profile around that so um yeah that's where that started well you are just a kid so i, I can probably go along with that what about uh helmet cam and and that sort of thing we've had that here in new zealand but predominantly only on our big days you guys seem to be using it a bit more does it make you conscious particularly of the whip and um and your actions do, do, does that play a part for you uh, no, not really. Um, I suppose it probably does for some drivers. They sort of think about it a bit more, but I tend to just forget about it really when it's on. So, um, yeah, I, Racing Queensland have done a super job along with um, the um, filming crews over here. They've done a really awesome job in sort of bringing in those new innovations and it's really good to see. I watched you driving in one of the Trot Rods series. So they're over like half a lap, aren't they? Or basically a lap of, say, Redcliffe. Um, you were driving a horse called Bumper. Gee, that, that must be exciting to, to drive in because you just flat out the whole way. Yeah, that was um, really different. We, that was actually the first heat. I drove right. Bumper in that one. Um, it was something really different. It was exciting. It's always up for something different and have a go. So it actually turned out a really good series. And I think it was really successful. What about the best horse you've driven? What's the one that stands out for you? Um, oh, I've been lucky enough to drive a few really nice ones. I got to sit behind um, Pelosi. Yep. She's obviously a really classy mare. Um, I got to sit behind her a few times. Um, yep. Speech is Silva, um, obviously formerly with the All-Stars, he came over to Darren Weeks and Kylie Rasmus and I had four drives behind him, I think, and four wins. He's a superstar and um, hopefully we see him back at the track sooner rather than later. Yeah, um, I, I remember him being here, Angus, and, and he wasn't a superstar, but there you go. Um, obviously he's enjoying the Queensland weather. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then smart as can be, she was pretty special. Um, she was a really classy filly and raced really good um, last season. Um, I'm, I think she's been retired now, but she was just unbelievable to sit behind. Um, I drove her in a few trials and one race. She actually ran second behind Amazing Dream when she was over here. Yeah, She ran a 53-4 half around Albion Park that night. It was just mm. out of this world. Well, it appears to me that you're loving this game. There's no chance of you sliding out of it in the, in the near future. And with your success, um, I'm sure you're going to have a few more followers uh, uh, via the box seat as well. What, what about a horse perhaps for one or two that we could follow, uh, Angus Garrard and, and his career there in Queensland? Um, we've actually got one here that 
we're working at the moment. He um he's a rock and roll dance out of a family out of a mare that we've had a lot of success with in the past. Um, his name's Rock and Home. He didn't race as a two year old, but we gave him I think four or five starts as a three year old. He won one and placed a couple of times, but just really immature and he seems to have come back really good this time as a four-year-old so hopefully he can sort of um, put a few performances together and really go the distance this time in all right rocking home it is for the box seat uh, viewers hey angus thanks for taking the time out of your busy schedule to uh, have, a, have a yarn to us um, great to see your, your talent out on the track and you're having good success and we hope that continues for you and maybe we'll catch up again uh, in the near future thanks for your time for sure, Greg. Thanks for that. Michael, likeable young lad. Gee, he's doing a great job. Some of the horses he's driven, Speech and Silver, Pelosi mentioned those. Uh, he's giving us uh, rock and home to follow in the future. But he's a talented kid. They call him the kid. And, uh, yeah, it was nice to get a, an opportunity to have a chat to him about uh, his passion for the game. That's clearly evident. Yeah, and harness racing is very much an Australasian-wide industry. We're going to have so many horses going to the Queensland Carnival. It's good to get to know some more about some of those people who, particularly in Angus's case, um, could be around for decades driving winners watched here in New Zealand via trackside. So, yeah, good insight, Greg, into to what makes him tick because Queensland is a state we don't have a lot of contact with as New Zealanders, more so than, say, a Victoria or a New South Wales. But clearly a young man with his head screwed on the right way. Yeah, he won a couple of races at Albion Park last Saturday night, including one, I think it was Montana Chief, at about 60 to 1. And his strike rate at Redcliffe, I think top three, he averages uh, is about 45% every time he goes around there. He's, he's in the top three, so it might be worth following him uh, there. Speaking of Australia, South Australia, let's go to the Cup there. Anthony Butt ventured uh, to... SA and Boots Electric, who we know won the Bonanza, beautifully rated in France, now won 10 from 20, Michael, and uh, beat Stable Mate Perfect Stride. Yep, started his career, as did Perfect Stride here in New Zealand. Good hard running horse. Adds to Anthony and Sonia's open class, maybe Grand Circuit connections. They have Wolf Stride, of course. They had this horse and Perfect Stride also, who is now stepping into the open grade. So. Um, he's just having, or they are just having a massive career boost since moving to Victoria with, of course, the support of Emilio and Mary Rosati, who own all the stride horses. Yeah, and of course, a horse we know well, Aladdin, took out the uh, South Australian derby. He won the Harness Million here in New Zealand uh, at Christmas time. And, well, he was just too strong. Kieran Manning, she got her third derby, and he was simply too good. It's win number five for him, trained by a man who doesn't swing a golf club. Well, he may very well, but not to the level uh, that his namesake did. Greg Norman, you were telling me off camera, Michael, a decent sort of a bloke. Yeah, good fella, Greg. Um, often ventures his horses from South Australia into Victoria, and uh, this horse is just going to have a massive time over there, Greg. He's, as I said earlier in the show, he's three till December 31. It's an awfully long time away, so he can do a lot of racing. Just goes to show you that disparity between, not the best ones, their derbies are close enough to as good as their derbies. It's a mix and a match, but but when you get below the derbies over there, a horse is like Aladdin just slot into those three-year-old races, even though that was a minor derby, and they just win the grip. When they bought this horse, they said to Peter Blanchard, who was the ag uh, agent involved, we want to win the South Australian derby. Job done. They just did. Yeah. <laughs> Nice work. Nice. Um, speaking of Kiwi success over there, Chubby Checker, who came out of the Tolomon Lodge, Kim Barron, Blair Orange operation, four from four now. Star Galleria got his second win, Michael, so that was nice to see for him, and he stormed home on that occasion. Check in win number 11 for Darren Hancock and Arnold, another one that came out of Tolomon Lodge, uh, uh, made it win number 12. Often I click on these horses and go, I wonder how they're going now. Oh, it's won 100,000. Oh, that one's won 100,000. Some of the stock that maybe won half of, would have won half of that, here in New Zealand, they, they just dominate in Australia and, and are very prolific for their for their new owners. <sighs> Touchy subject, Greg. Yep. Two reasons people don't like to export their horses, be told we should retain more horses here. Secondly, they race their horses more often. Yep. There's horses in Australia who race at Bathurst every Wednesday night. And not only do they race at Bathurst every Wednesday night, they then pop into town every third Saturday and race at Menangle. Now, we can try and breed more horses, and everybody tells me we don't breed enough horses. Well, that's fine. There's wastage. We obviously don't qualify some horses. All horses should basically be able to qualify, if it's any good at all. 
race in the worst races, no one cares, it's more just product people turn over. But more importantly, if I have a good pacer and it's sound and it goes around, why is it starting 14 times a season? Good I'm point. not talking about your best horse. Yep. Krug, Krug should start 12 to 14 times a season yep. or something like that. If I've got a horse who just hacks around every week, why isn't it starting 40, 50 times a season? That's what they do in Australia. Yep. And that's where that money's built up. It's not about stakes. And people say, oh, there's more opportunities. Well, there's more opportunities because the horses are racing. Racing time. every week. Yeah. I deal with people all the time at Bathurst, which is one of my favourite places in Australia. And they race every Wednesday. And yep. if the draw doesn't suit, they just go back and sit in and they come home. And, and punters expect that, which is why the, the money's on for the horses who are drawn well. But we don't race our horses enough. I'm not talking everybody should do it, not every horse. I'm not saying that's the way it should be. But if you've got a horse who just goes to Cambridge every Thursday night, why don't you race it every week? Yeah. And that's where the money comes in Australia. It doesn't come from better opportunities. It comes from, from racing, racing more horses often. more yep. often. Yep. Yep, very good point. Uh, Spellband makes her debut, Melton, this week, drawn the outside in about race number five. And yesterday at Menangle, uh, Expensive Ego was winning. It was only a dollar ten, so I didn't think too many people uh, got too much there. But he's a very, very good horse. Now, sure. Craig, just, just on Expensive Ego, he went 148.5 yesterday, yep. just bolted in. Mm. He's been set for the Rising Sun, the new race in the yep. first week of July. Could be up against Copy That, Amazing Dream, and Krug's in the market for the race. I don't think he'll go there. Yep. But if he does, that could be a real winter bonus for us all. Amazing dream, expensive ego, copy that, mm. head to head. That'd be a hell of a show. Yeah, it certainly would be. Short break for us here on Your Box Seat. When we come back, we'll have a look at Addington Raceway. They have a good program there on Thursday night. You're in your home straight in your box seat, Addington Raceway, Thursday night. Let's get into the Garrard Sire Stakes a two-year-old heat. It's heat number three. I want to show you this trial, Michael. Chimmy Churi, the name of the horse. David Butch is actually coming down to drive it for Michael House. It's part owned by the Stonewall Stud Limited. Gee, this horse was good. Uh, 57 won the closing sectional. Mostale Ben, who's a race rival, has been a race winner. He won this really nicely. He, he might be a pretty talented two-year-old. He does take on the likes of Bollinger, uh, My Ultimate Chevron, of course, won the Sapling Stakes, Franco Mack, who's been a winner too. So he'll have his uh, work cut out to beat them. But I tell you what, on that trial, he'll be very competitive. It's an unusual tie-up. I, I hadn't heard of that one before. The Michael House training for Stonewall Stud, D. Butch coming down to drive type thing. So, yeah, that's, it's an interesting set of people involved in that. Also, obviously, all very talented at what they do. I thought Bollinger would probably win this race because it had barrier one. Um, Franco Mack has been really good, but he was just a little bit off last time, I thought, and I thought the d differential on barrier draws... Would make uh, the difference. Would, would yeah. make the difference there. I know he's going to be your better of the week. But, yeah, the, the winner of that race there, or that trial, um, pretty impressive. Interesting to see how he pans out. Yeah, it will be. Uh, let's have a look at the Neverly R Phillies heat, where better twists come up with a beautiful draw. Uh, that's La Rosa in front. She was a subsequent winner to this. Better twist to the outside. Getting through on the inside, life's a beach who's again has been a subsequent winner since this Neverly R heat. Big thing this week, Michael, better twist, barrier two. Natalie Rasmussen takes the reins. Life's a beach, barrier eight. Uh, I think that'll be the difference. It also depends on what they do at the start, whether better twist can race forward and get the lead. Because we said this months ago, Greg, and it's happened a lot since. When she has to sit parked, she's vulnerable, and she usually pays a dollar forty, and you don't need to be taking a dollar forty about horses sitting parked because they don't win very often. And she's cost punters a few times. That's not her fault. She's yep. obviously a very, very good me, a filly. But if she leads, she'll probably win. If she has to sit park, she comes into play of being vulnerable. Life's a beach being has been excellent, excellent for Tony yeah. Barrett. Really good against the older horses last time. And, yeah, I think a lot of people are really happy for Tony to see him with a good horse, uh, with the Woodland Stud Syndicate and, and being a player in the group ones coming up. This week, Barrier 8 makes it really tricky. 
Uh, looking forward to seeing that. Better starts draw on the inside. She's actually pretty quick off the gate. Was brave at uh, Rungiora on Sunday, and she'll be uh, pretty hard to beat in that. Just on Addington, they've got a big owners' night. The first premiere for them on the 14th of May. Uh, that is being well patronised. I can promise you that. So if you want to go along to that, that's both horse people and owners, and any owner. Don't have to be an owner on the night only. You can get along to that. Contact Darren Williams and the team, and uh, it's their ladies' night the following week. So uh, that has the Oaks, and um, that's uh, certainly being well sought after as well. So a couple of very good premiers there. Bookies results from uh, last week. Thank you to Matthew Peden for sending these through to us. A uh, good bet there on All American Lover, 3000 at $2.30. Tears Legacy was well backed at Addington. Uh, better Grunter again led for Blair Orange. He had a remarkable week. I think he had about 10 or 11 winners, Michael, including four from four at the Y Rio meeting there on Saturday. Uh, there's some of the misses uh, down there. Montana DJ was one of those $3,000 High Grove uh, and Gold Chain both missed out at $6,000 plays there. And in that size stakes, Phillies Champs True Fantasy, there's been a $1,000 bet there at $3.50. But on Blair Orange, he's... Uh, he certainly uh, made a mark last week, uh, double figures in a week any time from Forbury Park uh, all the way through to Rangiora did uh, an enormous job there. Let's have a look at the map um, and see where you can go harness racing this weekend. Addington Raceway, 10 races, 7 past 5 the start time there with... Uh, Covered both of those features, the Garrard Size Stakes Heat and the Nevilliar Phillies Heat. There it is, number seven, and uh, underway there at uh, 6.22. Winton has 11 races. Uh, Alexandra Park, that leads into Alexandra Park, where we have all of those Group 1 features. Uh, the $95,000 there, Woodland Stud, Caduceus Club, Phillies, HR Fiskins and Son, Anzac Cup, and the Dawson Harfoot and partner, Taylor Mile, along with the Lone Star Sire Stakes. 5.26, the 10 race program there from uh, Alexandra Park, all done by 10 o'clock. Eight races out of uh, Rangiora on Sunday. 1.05, the start time there, and Meth race on Monday as part of Anzac weekend. 12 races there, 11.39 is the first of those. Best bets, Michael. Haven't been able to say this for a while. Both rolled in last week. Yes, they were short. Stack opened $1.75. Hopefully you got some of that. Uh, this week, I'm with Bollinger. Uh, inside draw, I think it's his race to lose, or those are the words of Hayden Cullen. Said he's worked very well this week. What about for you? I was going to go for copy that, but I just think there's enough moving parts and that I wasn't quite sure. So going for uh, for Louis the punter in race nine, I think it is. Um, yeah, it comes out of a nice enough maiden race at Cambridge. Trialed really well last week when opened up by Andrew Drake at Pukekohe in a field where I thought there were only two other winning chances and maybe he would head forward. So uh, Louis might be my bet in the ninth on the card. Happy enough just to be getting a touch over even money. Yeah, and of course, don't forget about the Harness Jewels, Michael. 6th of June, see reports coming out from David Branch and the team there from Cambridge. The GH Mum Marquee is sold out. Uh, the Skyline Lounge, Spates Summer, Ultra Sports Bar, they're going pretty quickly too. Um, I don't think we can overstate this, Michael. This event will be sold out, and we've already talked about uh, the quality of horse that are going to be going to the Jewels of 2021 with IRT. Yeah, and Cambridge on a Sunday, obviously all the galloping peeps will go to the, the gallops on Saturday at Ellerslie, but they, they can rock up and attend. So a lot of them will, which is around the corner from where plenty of them live. So yeah, you might get a couple of hundred more people coming in from that side of the industry as well. So yes, yeah, it, it's going to be a great way to end a season because we didn't have one last year, Greg. Yep. So again, jump on the website there, check it all out. And if you want to be somewhere where you can sit down... Um, you need to get off your ass there and book. You certainly have to do that, Michael. That's a nice way to end our show for this week. Michael and I will catch you in seven days' time.